Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Alan Deal. I currently serve on the board of the Interreligious Council of Lynn County and I'm also the Vice President of the Humanists of Lynn County. On this morning's show, we'll be discussing the topic, Rethinking the American Prison System. Now here to discuss uh, this subject with us this morning, I'm very excited uh, about our three guests and I would like each of you uh, to just introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and why this particular subject is uh, important to you. I'm Pete Wilson from the Lynn County Sheriff's Office. I'm currently the jail administrator for the 401 bed facility here in Cedar Rapids. Um, recidivism is important to us at the Sheriff's Office to make sure that um, people receive the services they need and um, help them from keep coming back to jail. Excellent. Thank you, Pete. I'm Mary Crandall and I am the coordinator of the RISE program and this is a program that helps people when they are released from jail or prison. Uh, it's a very important program because there are so many obstacles facing these people when they get out of jail or prison so we're there to help guide them uh, so they don't go back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And my name is Jerry Bartroff. I'm the director of the Iowa Department of Corrections been in the corrections business for over 36 years uh, and I've seen it change a lot. Um, our vision is an Iowa no more, no more victims and our mission is creating opportunities for safer communities. So I think we're all saying the same thing about how the criminal justice system can be more fair and that we focus on people living in our communities and not coming back to jail or prison. Yeah, well, um, we certainly had a lively kind of pre-show discussion. There's going to be a ton to talk about, um, and it seems like this is of great interest, both locally, nationally. So I do want to jump right into it. Uh, so one of the things, one of the reasons it, it jumped out at me was uh, um, it, a particular article I came across last year, and, one, and in that it talked about kind of our incarceration rate in the United States as it compares to excuse me, as compares to other uh, countries in the world. And as of 2017, as of 2018, uh, the United States incarceration rate is right around 655 per 100,000 citizens, which is uh, sometimes as much as six times more than the average uh, kind of in industrialized nation similar to ours. Mm -hmm. So I want to just kind of throw this out. Maybe I'm starting with you, Jerry, because okay. I think you're going to have a better feel of this. Mm -hmm. What are some of the contributing factors to the U.S. being so skewed out there? One of the things I, important, and that national data is important, mm -hmm. um, but also if you look at Iowa, um, the incarceration rate is 281 per 100,000 folks, which is lower than most. Yeah. Um, but I think w when you look at mass incarceration or high incarceration rates, um, it's because we made some policy decisions to do that. If you begin to look at our communities and disturbances in our communities in, in the early 70s and, 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 and riots in the streets, uh, you begin to look at the war on drugs and the, 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 the political rhetoric, rhetoric began to be, let's get tough on crime. Mm. We can reduce crime if we lock more people up and we pass laws, we increase penalties, we added mandatory minimum sentences, and some states abolished parole. So from 1972 to this period of time, the incarceration rate in increased sevenfold. Hmm. Uh, and I think it's because we made policy decisions. So if we got into this mess because of policy decisions, is there an opportunity for policy decisions to drive a different conversation? Hmm. And, and that's where I think we begin to have the conversation about reducing incarceration, reducing recidivism, giving people the opportunity that are incarcerated to learn the skills to be successful when they return, to have these resources they need in the community when they transition out. And people like your organization are so critical to that process because oftentimes people have lost family members. There's no longer a support system. They need to have people in the community that understand and support them, but also hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll definitely get into, you know, Mary, and your, 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 your program and what it does. Mm -hmm. um, Pete or Mary, do you have any other comments just generally about 
um, you know, the incarceration rate in the United States, maybe what, why you, what you see as the problem or some of the solutions. Otherwise, we can, we can certainly move on. I'd agree with you, Jerry, that I think that we're locking more people up than we have before due to the, due to the different crimes we're committing and the seriousness of the crimes we're committing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right, very good. And so um, let's talk a little bit about the recidivism rate, mm -hmm. which is a huge thing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the incarceration rate is high. Um, I think the Iowa's budget when it comes to uh, our correctional facilities is somewhere in the neighborhood of 380 some million dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a big part of our budget. Absolutely. Um, and so reducing the number of people in there is important. And part of that is obviously reducing recidivism. So mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. go into the system, mm -hmm. how do we keep them from getting back into the mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, Pete, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think or? that when they get in the system, we need to provide opportunities to them to better themselves while they're in the system. Mm -hmm. So when they come out of the system, they can re reintegrate back into the community and, and be a protective member of society. Yeah, absolutely. Mary? Uh, one thing that we find at RISE, when the people, when our participants uh, come to us from RISE, from jail or prison, Many times they have absolutely nothing. I mean, they have nothing. They don't have an ID, they don't have a birth certificate, they have no clothes other than what they have on their backs. Uh, and so they need, number one, a support system. They, they certainly need somebody to help them get all these things that they don't have. So we provide that support system for them. We provide a safe, non-judgmental place for them to come. Uh, and uh, they're not judged. I mean, we accept everybody. And um, as far as recidivism goes, and I, uh, you know, the people that we see um, have addictions, they have mental illnesses. And I used to think that if a person had a job and had a place to live, they'd be okay. Hmm. But unless they have help for their mental illness, and treatment for their substance abuse and a safe community that they feel supported in, mm -hmm. the house and the job aren't enough. Yeah, no, I, I, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I wanna follow that up with a, a specific question for you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding is in 2015, Iowa received a $3 million grant mm -hmm. um, from the US, U.S. Department of Justice specifically mm -hmm. to address mm -hmm. what, was, what was seen as the rise in recidivism mm -hmm. in Iowa particularly. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how that $3 million has been utilized to um, address a rise in recidivism rate in Iowa? I, 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 and actually, the, the recidivism rate has stayed fairly stable over the last 10 years. Okay. Uh, the recidivism rate in the state of Iowa is currently 35.4%, uh, which is lower than most other states in the region uh, and one of the lower ones nationally. That's over a three year period of time that we look at that. Um, recidivism reduction to me and the grant was seed money to help change the way our organization does business. We want to make sure that when people come to prison that we first assess their risk. We assess what happened that led to their criminal behavior. We screen for mental illness. We, we screen for and, and test them for academic skills. We look at behavioral health issues. Uh, and we begin to start, in many, in many ways it's like a medical model. We want to make sure that we diagnose the problem correctly so that we can, can then begin treatment but then we start discharge planning at the, at, the, at the same kind of thing. So with grants, typically you, you buy a whole lot of staff and you focus on a, on, on a population. Mm -hmm. What we did is we focused on changing the infrastructure on how we do business and corrections. We focus everything on what is proven in the literature to reduce recidivism, and that's the kind of staff that we hire, that's the training that we provide, that's the programs that we provide, and we're making sure that everything that we're doing has an impact on reducing recidivism. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, reducing recidivism is, is, is the fancy kind of technical term. But that every individual under community-based supervision, which I think is a big part of this equation, receives the services they need and that we are there to help and support, but also hold them accountable so they don't commit other crimes. Mm -hmm. So we invested in our staff with that $3 million in core correctional practices, recidivism reduction, change of the face of correctional officers from people who demand compliance to people who are actually involved in the change, change process. 
So when we got that grant, we were focusing on a population of moderate to high risk probationers and parolees. We've seen a gradual reduction, but infrastructure changes like I just described, it takes years to implement. Yeah, and I think the goal was that the recidivism rate was reduced by 30% in five years, in which we put in, in, in 2020, five years, right. correct? So, so we're, we're, we're in, in, in what I call the implementation phase. Okay. It's hard for us to know whether what we're doing now makes a difference in the long run, but the evidence tells us that it should. But another part of doing corrections business right now is, is if you expect a certain outcome and you aren't getting it, why not? Mm -hmm. What do we need to do differently? Yeah. And, and it, there's, there's no prescription that can be followed if you aren't constantly looking at what your outcomes are and measuring your success. So that's a big part of that grant too, is, is what do the numbers tell us? Mm -hmm. So I, I, wanna, um, I wanna throw out this particular statement to all three of you and then whoever feels the most inclined to, to respond to it, feel free to do so. Um, but, uh, again, this was from an, an article from The Economist dated May 27th of last year. Uh, and the title of that particular article was, Too Many Prisons Make Bad People Worse. There is a better way. Um, do you agree with that statement? Why or why not? And uh, who, who feels? In reading that statement, I would not agree with that. Um, as for most people in prisons, I know that um, the prison system offers a lot, and Jerry can talk more about that, but to rehabilitate people and to teach them skills and education when they get to prison. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that people think that they do go to prison and we're just warehousing people. That's not at really accurate of what is actually going on in the prison system. Mm -hmm. the, the majority of these people learn skills while they're in there and learn what resources are available on the outside once they get out. Mm -hmm. I, I think in, 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 in that statement there's some things that I would agree with and some things down the path that Pete has talked about that I would argue. Um, I do think uh, that there are people who are sent to prison who don't need to be in prison. One of our strategic goals is to only incarcerate those that need to be incarcerated. And how would you define that? Uh, those are people that are high risk, who have committed violent offenses, that have a long history of criminal behavior, that have had opportunities to be in prison and be released and come back again and again and again. Those people are the most serious threat to our communities. Uh, if we focus our resources on those and reduce that likelihood of them committing other offenses, that's actually where we get the most bang for our buck as far as resources. But that being said, there's a whole lot of people who come to prison that could do just fine in community corrections. And if you take those people and you put them in an environment where people have criminal attitudes and orientation, they're looking at ways that they can gain the system. They're trying to take care of themselves and diminish the importance of others. You put people that aren't at that same risk in with people like that and you lock them up. I get concerned about some kind of contagion effect. Yeah, I could bet. Mm -hmm. like, like the people that you're living with. So, right. so to me, one of the things is making sure that we only incarcerate those who need to be and people that are low risk let's keep them in the community and working in the community and taking care of their families, participating in some of these programs, then we can begin to say there is a better way because we're focusing prison on those people mm -hmm. that we need to incarcerate to keep our community okay. safe. It's I totally agree with that. I, I see, uh, unfortunately we don't have the facilities for what I'm going to suggest, but there are so many people with addictions. I don't think they belong in prison or jail. I think they belong in a rehab place. Uh, people with mental illness, uh, to me, do not belong in prison or jail. They belong in some kind of facility where they are getting help with their illness. And because of their mental illness, they will maybe commit a crime, but it, you know, it's what comes first. And the addictions are so, so, uh, you know, and it is against the law, so you, mm. you know, they break the law, but yeah. th they don't belong in prisons mm. or jails with the hardened criminal, I don't think. Yeah. But we need the resources mm -hmm. to, to, in, the to, that's true. in the community to put these people. That's right. true. And, and right. that's what we're I lacking right it. now. And, and mental health is, as everybody can see, is a big burden on the system. That's right. We're not doing it for the people, anything for the people that have the mental illnesses, just locking them up. I totally agree. Right. Yeah. We, yeah. 
So, you know, there is this, as I was having discussions with different people about it, and, and this particular article focused on, um, you know, kind of going back to the title of the show, which is Rethinking the American Prison System. Mm -hmm. So the key word there being rethinking, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and it, so if it isn't working, kind of like Jerry, mm -hmm. what you said earlier, let's mm -hmm. continue to look at it. Mm -hmm. and, and whether it be our impact on our, you know, how much money we're spending on these prisons, the recidivism rates mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, so there was a there was a quote uh, here by uh, Nelson Mandela actually, and he said this: uh, "No one truly knows a nation until it's been inside its jails." And so this kind of goes along with this idea of kind of a punitive culture, right? In which we kind of, as a you know, as maybe as a country or whatever, we you know, when somebody commits a crime, they deserve punishment. They deserve to do hard time, and that kind of fulfills our sense of justice. Mm -hmm. Is, there seems to be a perception that that is the prison culture, right? Mm -hmm. That it, we have a punitive uh, culture in, in, in the United States mm -hmm. when it comes to our prison system. People are doing hard time because they deserve to be punished, and this is working. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about those things, mm -hmm. about maybe what is the perceived culture within mm -hmm. our jails and prison mm -hmm. system, and uh, what is the actual mm -hmm. uh, culture within our system, and, and what that does say about right how Americans view right. uh, criminal justice. I think one of the things that we need to recognize as far as rethinking prisons and incarceration is, is rethinking the way that we do business. Uh, and it used to be that prisons were these places like in Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> right. these big old castle looking things that uh, were definitely designed to keep people locked in. They were also designed to keep people from the outside coming in. To me, one of the biggest transformations and, and the rethinking is that prisons are communities amongst themselves. And that 90 to 95 percent of the people in prison now are going to be returning to our communities. How can we change the face of prisons from being this castle on the hill that nobody touches to a place where we invite the community in? The people are going to be coming out and live, they're going to be our neighbors at some point. How can we be begin to bring community values inside a prison so that those values are consistent with community safety when people return to the community? So I think we're transforming prisons in many ways. I believe, and many, and the people that, that I work with, people come to prison as punishment, not to be punishment, not to be punished. Mm, right. And the goal then is how can we use time out from all the other things that happen in a person's life while you're incarcerated to overcome that addiction, get mental health treatment, get your GED and high school diploma, learn a skill, learn how to think and associate with pro-social people instead of the people that are locked up that have no will or desire yeah. to be a part of the community yeah. again. So it, it's making prisons part of our communities. Mm, mm -hmm. And instead of setting them off, yeah, yeah, uh, I, I think I think that's a huge transformation. Yeah, and and a huge challenge yes. too. I yes. can imagine, yeah. right? Because for most people, most people have never been to a prison, mm -hmm. and most people don't even know where the prisons are, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so yeah, a uh, huge challenge. But I think there's a lot of potential there for sure. I think this go. Um, I'd like to go into now, Pete, just a little bit about what you do. You know, as administrator of the Lynn County Jail, um, to kind of partner with organizations to prevent crime, so that before they get to prison or the or jail or whatever, um, what what are some of the things that that uh, locally we're doing? Locally, we're trying to engage at, uh, youngsters at an early age. We have a uh, school resource officer, as do most agencies, that to deal with the kids in the school, and they have programs to educate them. In the jail system itself, we partner up with like the prize program. We allow volunteers from the community to come in and provide services, and such as rise program, they have navigators and they have mentors that can work with people and, and kind of get a jump start when they get out of jail as to services that are offered in the community, and they assist with housing and jobs, that that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, so how much success? I mean, you're in the, in the jail system. You're dealing with people that are obviously fairly temporary, right? They're not staying there for Correct. long periods of time. Um, how, how, what, what are some of the things that you found to be most successful to keep them from moving into ultimately the prison system or to keep them from coming back? I mean, just what are some of the things that really seem to, to work 
or are, what are some of the more progressive ideas that you have? I think educating the, the inmates as to services available to them, um, having people from the outside come in and talk to them so they're not dealing with just law enforcement, now they're dealing with people in the community that are willing to help them and that they know there are people out there willing to help them and, and care about them. Yeah. No, that's huge. That really is. Because, I mean, if we can keep them from getting into the system, I mean, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a gigantic mm -hmm. win. I think a lot don't know that there's resources out there. Or right. They know there's resources, but they, they don't know how to get there. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what our navigators and our RISE program mm -hmm. do is they, they offer, here's what's out there, and we're, we want to help you do this. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like there's a shortage of those programs um, in our community? those type of programs or do you feel like um, I wouldn't say there's a shortage I think in the jails it's hard because we've only have a certain amount of time during the day that we can have programs and you know you have church services come in you have AA and NA come in you have the mentoring program come in and so times times really limited and and we really can't teach skills because they're there for such a short period of time mm. and Jerry what are some of the, the programs that have really worked for you that you've seen within the prison system? Um, there, there are a myriad of them, but I think one of the things that's important, and, and I think it's important to talk lot to law enforcement and, at the community level in the jails. Um, when you think about the Department of Corrections, I think oftentimes you think of prisons. There's over 30,000 Iowans on probation and parole supervision in our communities today. The, the programs that they participate in, and they successfully discharge their sentence from probation and don't come to prison, to me, that's probably a better way to manage the prison population than is to release a whole lot of people and not have the support services mm -hmm. they need, that they need. So I think when you think of uh, it's a continuum, mm. um, and that uh, and, and for people that are on on probation supervision, only 13 percent of them recidivate. So we've got a really good community-based correction system in this state. And Bruce Vandersand and people in the sixth district are are those kind of people, and we've got those all over the state. One of the things that I think that happened that caused our recidivism rate to go up a little bit is because we started releasing more people, okay. but we didn't increase the number of people to catch them mm. when they returned to parole. So things like risk needs and response, responsivity are principles that guide the programs to make sure that you get the treatment that you need to address the criminogenic needs that increased your risky behavior. Mm. Cognitive behavioral therapy yeah. is, is huge to change the way that you think and feel, mm -hmm. which then changes the behavior. I've seen that there's success right. with, yeah. that, with that. Um, uh, that uh, people that are sex offenders receive the treatment that they need so that when they return to the community, the likelihood of them recidivating and hurting people in really bad ways is, is, is drastically reduced. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's all these programs that are, that are proven to reduce recidivism that we are trying to increase the capacity to deliver then we think our communities are safer. But I don't want to minimize the importance of the human side of this equation. That people lose their families while they're incarcerated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And returning to the community without any kind of support system is really difficult. I've, I've talked to people who have been incarcerated. And I don't call them offenders, I don't call them inmates. People that have been incarcerated or people that are on supervision, I think that's another transformation, is, is trying to make sure that people have the human side of re-entry addressed. If you're in prison for eight years and you're walking out in the streets, you don't know how to use an ATM machine, you don't have a cell phone, you don't know how to navigate transportation, you don't have people to turn to for help, you don't have people that know how to navigate a system. Unless we can connect the human side of a person returning to the community with the things that we've done to reduce risk, that's a big gap. Yeah. It's a huge gap. And when you think about it, I mean, you know, 15 to 30 year olds, right? This is kind of your male, that's one of your you know, big populations, big. right? And I mean, if you miss out on those really important parts of your uh, times in your life, mm -hmm. when it comes to learning labor skills, mm -hmm. learning life skills, mm -hmm. I mean, that can just be a, a huge setback. Mm -hmm. And sometimes all they have to fall back on is some of the crime they've committed mm -hmm. or people they've, you know, they're mm -hmm. familiar with. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's a huge part. And then, of course, just the breaking up of families. Right. I mean, and um, I know there's been, uh, you know, programs locally and otherwise that, you know, really do focus on once they get out of prison to how do we keep these families together? Mm -hmm. How do we bring them back mm -hmm. together? Mm -hmm. um, so I think right now we have about five minutes left. And Mary, I'd like you to kind of, I want to talk a little bit about what the program, RISE program, because this is, I mean, really 
well, what we're talking about here as far as helping, um, obviously all of us, right, which is important. Mm -hmm. and within the prison, within our jail system, everybody mm -hmm. partnering together. But your programs like yours is important. And I, your, your, uh, the RISE program, the mission of it states, through listening, guiding, and empowering individuals, RISE serves to foster self-esteem, reduce recidivism, as we've talked about, advance a safe community, and reduce public expenditures, also a very big deal. Tell us about, um, if you could, Mary, some of the services that RISE provides and some of the successes and okay. ultimately some of the challenges you face? We start by going into the jail. Every Monday night we go into the jail and Tuesday afternoon and we visit with the men and women when we go into jail to help them develop a plan for when they are released. So they just not, you know, they're released at nine o'clock at night and they're given what was on their back when they were arrested and then they get out of the door and they say, okay, I don't know where to go, except for I'm gonna call my old friend who mm -hmm. I you know, got in trouble with. So we, we develop a plan for them. They make goals so that they know where they're headed. And then they come to us uh, w when they get out and we go from there. What are your basic needs? What are the most important needs right now? Well, it might be getting an ID. Mm. So we are able to help financially with getting an ID and a birth certificate, which are really huge. Mm, yeah. um, but we also have a, a long list of employers that'll hire felons and a long list of landlords that'll rent to felons. Most of our people uh, are homeless, and so they start out in the shelter system. So we get them uh, hooked up with the shelter system. And the shelter system, uh, they go through Waypoint, and they're a huge help. Uh, but that first step in the jail is huge. It's a very, very important first step for us. We uh, give them food, we give them clothing, and we once they get an apartment, we're able to set them up in that apartment uh, because we have furniture, we have a storage unit with furniture that is packed full, so we could use definitely more space, especially in our RISE office, we could definitely use more space. Um, and we have household goods. People in the community are so generous and wonderful. So, uh, and you know, like I said before, I think one of the most important things we do is give them a comfortable place to come and have a cup of coffee and visit and know that they're safe and not being judged because they, that's their life. They have always felt judged, I think. Mm. So if uh, we just have a, a minute or so left here, um, so I mean, what, what's on your wish list when it comes to the RISE program? If somebody came along with, here's a chunk of money, what would you want to use that for? Bigger really space. Be okay. Number one. Uh, but uh, we could really use now uh, things like bikes, um, backpacks, uh, bike locks, um, tents, we have, an, we have not a lot, but we have several people who would rather be homeless than live in the shelter system. So they're sleeping under trees, and so we want to make them comfortable. So uh, space is a big thing, though. It's, it's, uh, we're, we're feeling really cramped where we are. Mm. So we're kind of, we have a committee working on that, and so we'll see what happens. But uh, Excellent. Well, yeah. I, I mean, there's, the, the need is always going to be there. That's right. And I mean, certainly we hope that it, it's not, but the reality is it's, it's definitely going to be there. So, uh, I mean, all of you are obviously dealing with this on a daily basis, both being, you know, as, as a director of the Iowa Department of Corrections, the, the jail here in Lynn County, and then as a, um, you know, with the RISE program. And so, you know, my hat goes off to all of you because it's, it's not an easy job. Mm -hmm. It certainly isn't. And so I commend all of you for your, for your efforts. And, um, you know, as we work together to, to hopefully improve our correctional system all the way from the top down. So again, thank you all for, for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm. And thank, thank you. you all for joining uh, us here. And we hope you have a great Sunday. And uh, thank you again. We'll see you next week. Take care.